Good day to all of you. We are extremely uh, excited uh, about a progressive and a productive day. Uh, ministers have come from around the country, really, uh, to share uh, with uh, Senator Sanders their heartfelt concern about what's taking place in uh, the African American community. Uh, today we discussed three different uh, and distinctive issues. Uh, the first one dealing with uh, education uh, and safeguarding our HBCUs, raising the standard uh, for public schools and making educational opportunities available uh, for those who are in urban centers. Uh, our second focus, focus was dealing with uh, Black Lives Matter uh, in terms of aggressive and militarized uh, policing, racial profiling, uh, mass incarceration, uh, and where there is inequitable sentencing and the full restoration uh, for those who have already served their time. Uh, the third area was uh, the area that black dollars matter. Uh, where are we in terms of capital? Uh, for it's very easy for African Americans to get uh, loans for used cars, but very hard uh, for us to get uh, loans to start small businesses. It's of 200% interest by the time they're fully restored. Uh, ATMs have just been dropped, uh, and we just see uh, miles uh, of predatory lending and check cashing stations, uh, but nothing really in the place of economic development. The epicenter of what has taken place uh, since uh, the Freddie Gray uprising has been simply around one CVS store. Uh, what the media has not reported, what has not been shared, uh, is the 18 to 20 uh, black-owned businesses that are still closed uh, because their insurance has not uh, stepped up to the plate and they have been ignored. Uh, it was so important for us that the senator did not, in fact, just hear uh, statistics and testimony without seeing the face of a community that is in urgent need of assistance. And while we were walking through that community, we heard echoes and cries of people saying, will you please bring us jobs? Uh, they're not looking for welfare. They're not looking for handouts. They're looking for an opportunity to work and to, in fact, be uh, uh, giving citizens back into the community. We're 45 miles uh, away from the White House, uh, and it doesn't even look like we're in America, but we look like almost a strip from a third world nation. Uh, but the people who are behind me stand and serve and bear witness but that this is not just a Baltimore problem, it is a black America problem. Uh, and so we've come from all over to really uh, challenge and to uh, hear from the senator, what is the vision for black America? How do we go forward and how do we move higher? The past two presidential election cycles, 2008 and 2012, the presidency by and large was delivered by the black electorate. Uh, this time around, we cannot just give our vote away to either the Democrat or the Republican Party. We do not want just empty promises. We wanted to hear a plan and a policy that is in place. And we were glad to hear uh, from Senator Sanders and to begin uh, a relationship of hearing from him. Uh, the people who stand behind me wanted uh, to be absolutely clear that this meeting I was not for an endorsement, but the beginning of a relationship. Yeah. Uh, as we are going to be talking uh, tomorrow, a delegation uh, is going to talk to uh, Senator uh, Rand, and in the upcoming weeks, uh, hopefully we will be talking to uh, uh, Senator Hillary Clinton. We want to hear from all of them uh, to hear what is their blueprint and roadmap uh, to strengthen, to equip, and to empower uh, the African-American community. Uh, we're meeting with both sides, both Democrat and Republican, uh, because in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, we don't have permanent friends, we have permanent interests. Uh, and our permanent interest is, in fact, the development of our people and the development of our community. We're glad to have uh, the senator here in Baltimore, not just in the inner harbor, but to be in the heartbeat of where black Baltimore is in fact trying to find itself. We wanted to show him we are a resilient community and as a consequence we are resilient people. We're glad to have him. Welcome, uh, Senator Sanders.
Dr. Bryant, thank you very much uh, for organizing this meeting, and let me thank all of you, not only for being here today, uh, but for the work you're doing every single day uh, for people who are hurting, uh, who are often living in the shadows, and for whom, as a nation, we do not pay much attention to. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that America is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But anyone who took the walk that we took, we took around this neighborhood would not think you're in a wealthy nation. You would think that you were in a third world country where unemployment is over 50 percent. A community that does not even have decent quality grocery stores where moms can buy quality food for their kids. A community in which the dream of getting a higher education for many kids is as real as is going to the moon. In the United States of America, 37 percent of African American children should not be living in poverty. In the United States of America, we should not be having more people in jail than any other country on earth, disproportionately black and Hispanic. In the United States of America, we should not have a child care system which is largely dysfunctional and unaffordable. We need fundamental changes in our national priorities. We do not need to give more tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. We need to start investing in communities all over this country today that are hurting, that are often forgotten about. And rather than sending our kids to jail, we should be investing in jobs and education. We don't need more jails. We don't need more incarceration. There is an enormous amount of work to be done, and we have the people to do that work. What we need is changes in our national priorities and to stop ignoring those many, many millions of people who are hurting today, who are not receiving the kind of attention or redress that they are entitled to from their government. Thank you. Well, Field, if uh, there are any uh, questions uh, from the press. Uh, Senator, um, we talked to some people in the community They said they were skeptical because there are not enough jobs. And you have a $1 trillion infrastructure plan, which, you know, how is that going to get into these communities? A lot of times that money ends up in developers or as it has in Baltimore City. How is it going to get to the people who need it? Well, the first thing we have to do is to recognize the reality of real unemployment in America. The official unemployment rate is 5 percent. The real unemployment rate is 10 percent, and for the African community, African-American community, it is substantially higher than that. So we have several ideas, not just limited to these ideas, but several ideas that are out there on the table today. And number one, when you invest a trillion dollars over five years, you create 13 million decent-paying jobs. And in addition to that, you can create a whole lot of jobs rebuilding not only our crumbling infrastructure, our roads and bridges and water systems, but the kind of housing situation we are seeing right here in this community. We can put people to work all over America building affordable uh, housing. Second of all, uh, working with Congressman John Conyers of Michigan, he and I have introduced legislation that would provide a million jobs specifically for low-income kids, disproportionately again. African American and Hispanic kids. Makes a lot more sense to me to be getting kids jobs rather than seeing them hang out, seeing them hang out on street corners and end up in jail. So we've got a lot of work to do, but we have some very specific proposals to put millions of people back to work doing the work that America needs uh, to see done. Senator Sanders, pertaining to the economic justice issues that you talked about today, um, where on your priority list will those kinds of issues fall? At a very high level. Uh, it's not just the need uh, to create millions of jobs. Uh, it is the need to make sure that the jobs that we have pay people a living wage. And that's why I have fought for and believe that we should raise the minimum wage over a period of several years to $15 an hour. And we need pay equity for women workers so they don't continue to earn 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. And we need a new trade policy, by the way, 
which says to corporate America that instead of investing in China, that maybe they might want to start reinvesting in Baltimore or in the state of Vermont or in the state of California, because we have a trade policy which has cost us millions of decent paying jobs. And when we talk about it, talk about the economy, you have to talk about education. And that means not only supporting the historically black colleges and universities. In addition to that, we have got to make sure that every kid in America, regardless of his or her income, understands that if he or she studies hard, they will be able to get a higher education because we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. Bottom line is, in the last 30 years, we have seen a massive transfer of wealth from working families to the top one-tenth of one percent. What this campaign is about and what my presidency is about is transferring that wealth back into the hands of working families, back into our cities, back into our communities. This is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We can create a society in which all of our people have a decent standard of living, not a society in which almost all new income and wealth goes to the top 1%. That's what I'm dedicated to changing. Mr. Sanders, um, yesterday the Department of Justice launched another civil rights investigation into a large police force. Uh, your criminal justice uh, reforms, have, while broad, have focused a lot on prisons and sentencing. How much do you think police reform and structural racism is it? Is, is it I think it's a huge issue in our, if you read what uh, our principles are about, it deals with police reform and it deals uh, with the need to make sure that police departments around this country are held accountable. I'm glad. I made a request that the federal government do an investigation into what happened in Chicago and into the Chicago Police Department. Uh, it is my view that when uh, any individual is uh, killed or dies while in police custody, that should uh, bring forth a federal investigation. Uh, it is my view that the federal government can play a very important role in terms of police reform by providing incentives to local police departments around the country to do the right thing. And the right thing is to demilitarize our police departments. The right thing is to make sure that police officers have the training that they need to understand that lethal force is the last resort, not the first resort, uh, to make sure that police departments look like the communities that they serve in terms of their uh, diversity. So there's a lot to be done, but police reform uh, is certainly something that I believe is part of real criminal justice reform. Yeah. I'd like to know about employment for sex offenders. Yeah. Um, and um, training for the, the categories that, as well as for people who have um, left high school before graduating. Who have, I'm sorry? Who have left high school before yeah. graduating. Yeah, okay, yeah. Look, uh, again, every American should be deeply ashamed that we have more people in jail than any other country, 2.2 million people. We are spending $80 billion a year locking up fellow Americans. Even some of my conservative friends are beginning to understand that that does not make a lot of sense. And what you're talking about is the very high rate of recidivism that we have. So what sense is it that somebody who serves his time then goes back out, doesn't have job training, doesn't have education, lives in inadequate housing, what's going to happen to that person? They will fall back into the same environment that got them into jail in the first place. And then we're going to end up spending another $60,000 a year incarcerating that person. Obviously, it makes a lot more sense, to my mind, to make sure that when that person leaves jail, that person has the capability of holding down a job, that there is a job available, that there are community services supporting that person so that they don't fall off the wagon, so to speak, and end up back in jail. Senator, right, Senator maybe one more question. Earlier you yeah. said that it's very expensive to be poor yes. in America. Can you explain that? Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. Take a walk around this community. Now, my wife Jane and I live in Burlington, Vermont. A few blocks away from where we live, there's a very nice uh, grocery store, supermarket. We buy good quality food, produce at a reasonable price. You don't have that here. So the prices that people in this community are paying are substantially higher than what I pay, and the quality of the food that I get is significantly better. I put my money into a bank. I get some interest rates. If I have to cash a check, I'm not paying 15, 20, or 50 percent 
or whatever the interest rates may be, to cash a check because I have a bank. I didn't notice too many local branch banks in this community because I guess there aren't any. Okay? I can own a home. And at the end of the day, you gain wealth when you own a home and you don't have to rent. So the truth of the matter is that the interest rates the poor people pay are often higher. They're paying rent rather than living in their own homes. Not to mention that the jobs that they're working in, by definition, are paying uh, wages that are often uh, inadequate to feed, to take care of their families. So being poor is, in fact, uh, a very expensive proposition. Okay, thank you all very much. Do you not thank want you. to talk about ISIS? Your, your press secretary came in here and said not to ask questions about ISIS. Is there a reason that you don't want to talk about ISIS? <laughs> all right, what about ISIS, guys? How often are these people talking about the issues that we talked about today? <laughs> of course I'll talk about ISIS. But today what we're talking about is a community in which half of the people don't have jobs. We're talking about a community in which there are hundreds of buildings that are uninhabitable. We're talking about a community where kids are unable to go to schools that are decent. You want to ask me about ISIS? We will talk about ISIS. But what I said, and let me repeat, and you can agree with me or not, what I have said is that obviously ISIS and terrorism are a huge national issue that we've got to address. But so is poverty, so is unemployment, so is education, so is health care, so is the need to protect working families. And I will, I will continue to talk about those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator. Senator.